cut to the cut to the you know cut to the swim here. If we want to look at every track on the first two records, I can tell you who played what. I can tell you that you know Mike Slamer is still a good, very good friend of the band. Mike was um, Mike was brought in by Bo Hill to play some solos. Not every solo on the first two records. He's a fabulous player. He's a fabulous human being. I took lessons from him for a long time because I didn't like the experience, you know, of what, what went down. Um, and it made me a better guitar player. So hats off to Mike and, you know, maybe in a roundabout way, hats off to Bo for, for, you know, pushing me in that direction, you know, unknowingly. Hey everybody, it's Derek, aka Mr. Shudder with Masters of Shred, and we're here to bring you a very special edition of Talking Shred, where we are about to put the final nail in the coffin of possibly one of the guitar world's most largest misconceptions. What am I referring to? I'm talking about the multi-platinum award-winning worn guitarist, Joey Allen and Eric Turner, and who really played those solos as so many of you like to comment on, on our page. So without further ado, give it up for one half of the Warrant Shred Tag Team Supreme, the mighty Joey Allen. What is up, Mr. Shred? What is <laughs> thank up? You, thank you so much, brother, for being here. Um, I, know, I don't know if everybody actually knows this. They probably don't because I haven't released the footage. I had the pleasure of meeting you when you tore the roof off of the Pompano Beach Amphitheater this was about two weeks ago on Friday with Quiet Riot um, in Skid Row. And yeah. you guys just I killed it. I actually did a, a gear rig rundown with you, which now is just a memory because when I got out to Starbucks, when we disconnected there for a second, I went to Starbucks, pulled out my camera, went through it. And I go, okay, I got Eric Turner's rig rundown. This is great. And I got to get Joey Allen's because he played a very special riff for me that no one else has seen before. And then boom. It, it wasn't there. Oh, uh oh. Yeah. So, so you then, lost that footage? It never, I, I was going in and out, in and out to capture eight different segments. Uh -huh. And I don't think it captured, which is so disheartening. And here's the thing I'm going to blame it on my friends because I needed a camera guy. They all told me they were going to be there for me. And then guess who doesn't show up? Neither of them. Yeah. yeah. Then sounds they like up and they want tickets. Hey. Sounds, like a, sounds like a good camera guy. I know. Well, you know, you're welcome, that, to, dude. You're you're welcome to come out anywhere. We we've got about another twenty dates with the Skids and Quiet Riot, and it's it's a lot of fun. We're all friends, so it's just kind of, you know, we all mull around to each other's dressing rooms and talk and have fun and just, you know, dream weave about the past. Well, dude, it was it was a blast. I thank you for the hospitality you and Eric showed me because it was oh, it, was a, it was a blast from literally sound check straight through to hear all those songs again played like that i mean for me being a huge warrant fan i mean i listen to i go back and i, I listen to this stuff and i go glam metal there's yeah. lots of really heavy stuff in here especially when you get the dog heat dog and you go to the album yeah. album, it's like this is this is really more so to me heavy metal music a very well orchestrated the musicianship and that's what we're going to get into the musicianship of warren is amazing i don't think you guys get enough credit for that okay so here's what we'll do um we're gonna go over because we had discussed this, but the viewers don't know yet. We're going to go over the first two Warrant albums. The first two Great. platinum selling Warrant albums, which was 1989's Dirty, Rotten, Filthy, Stinking, Rich, and 1990s. Yes, only a year later. Jerry. Right. right. Crazy. Yes. Well, you don't see bands doing that anymore. Well, you don't see really new bands in general, but you don't see <laughs> bands doing albums back to back like that in such little time with just as many if not more hits yeah you don't see that that in that short period it's usually now like three to four years apart they're back in the 70s like kiss was doing a record every like 12 months like 12 or even two two a year like every eight months the beatles too the beatles 10 years all different albums all different sounds it's How insane do you yourself every year right it's <laughs> the beatles some good, the beatles had some good drugs I think. Yeah, I think, I think so too. I think they had some other helping hands in the studios too, help them make those things come, come true because it was crazy to make that many hits. Um, so we're going to go through each song. This is going to be pretty incredible. And we're going to list, and you're going to tell us who really played these solos. So we got it for the record now. 
This right. is going to be someone's going to have to get on Wikipedia after this and change a whole bunch of stuff. So well, let's let's start with this. To my knowledge, Mike played no rhythm on either record. Okay, zero. So so all the rhythm tracks were done by Eric and I, and they were usually doubled. Okay. Um, and they were done. You know, we had old Marshall. I've got a I've got a JCN. I've got a seventy eight Mark II fifty watt. So amps like that super simple the first record was you know there was a budget on it but the budget was such that like for instance um jerry dixon had to boil his bass strings you know wow they wouldn't get him new a, a few new sets to get through you know however many tracks are on that record you know so there's a lot of experience that goes on in the recording of a record that creates you know what we're about to talk about you know right. which is additional musicians playing on a record Exactly. Okay. All right. So let's let's just dive right in. First track, right. thirty-two pennies. Yes, sir. That's all you. Who played, the, who played the solo? That is all me. The intro stinger is Mike. Okay. The main solo is me. The outro stinger is Mike. Okay. Got it. So okay. who would play Mike's parts live? Would that be you or Eric Turner? Um, live right now. Believe it or not, on thirty-two pennies, I play the intro stinger. Eric, I taught Eric the solo just to balance it out live. So we play, you know, and then I play the outro. So I play Mike's part, and I gave my part to Eric live. Nice. Okay. Got it. Great. Okay. Wow. Next yeah. class, down yeah. boys. All Mike. Mike All solo. Mike. Yep. Mike solo. Okay. Got it. Next one, big talk. The intro stinger, Mike. The main solo, me. The outro stinger, Mike. Okay. I remember, I remember Eric, Eric also said that when I was hanging out with you guys. He said he, yeah. he did the solo and then he would play that part. And you're <clears> in the middle. <throat> right. Okay. Got it. Right. Just, right. Great solo in that song. I mean, Big Talk is killer because I, I posted that before. People were like, yeah, Mike Slamer. I'm like, okay, well, no, that's wrong. <laughs> okay. So yes and no. All right. So it's kind of split yeah. Up. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of intro and outro stingers on the first record, especially that Mike nailed down. You know, okay. and then I'd go back and I'd learn them and I'd play them live. And and you know, like I said, took lessons from him. He's a tremendous guitar player, tremendous person. Um, you know, he was he was part of the he was part of the recipe. Yeah, he definitely had a good ear. I always I can tell you, I somewhat tell his solos because of the whammy bar usage. He definitely could could he could phrase it very well i mean it's, it's an art to use i say whimmy bar and a wawa pedal people think yes. you should hit a wawa pedal on no right. there yeah. is a sweet spot there yeah. if you hit it right you'll know. Yeah. Yeah. You know so okay and then going right at the next track sometimes she cries which i all think mike was all mike which i think that yeah. i think that track had a solo going right into it right it does so now eric plays the intro eric plays the main solo and i play the outro okay got it this next track, number five on there, I heard the solo. I was working out to this song last week. I go, oh my gosh, this thing is, this is a, it's a long solo and it, it floats. And it was like telling a great story. So this was so damn pretty. Yes. It'd be, uh, so this is, so this, this is a, this is a back and forth. So I play the first pass. Eric plays the second pass. Mike plays the third pass. I play the fourth pass. Does that make sense? It did sound like there were different players playing that one right. solo. It was so long, right. I could tell like where it would cut off and the next guy would right. maybe come in with, with some different phrasing. Yeah, so, so there's, okay. I think there's six phrases there. I play the first one. Eric plays the second one. Mike plays the third. I play the fourth. Mike plays the fifth. I play the sixth. Okay, got it. Okay, well... There you go. If you guys have not heard or are familiar with that song, I'm sure you're all familiar with that song, but you're not. Go listen to that solo. It's pretty, as I call it, treadfational. <laughs> I got a lot of shred puns for this. That thing is off the charts. Uh, next one, DRFSR, Dirty, Rotten, Stinky, Filthy, Rich. So who did that? A monster, a monster solo done by Mr. Mike Slamer. Okay, that was my question. And I play that live now, and it's fun. And as we get on in dates and we play more, it gets tighter and tighter and tighter, and it's a it's a fun solo to play. Have you guys? Let me ask you: Do you remember when he laid that solo down? I mean, inside the studio, was it a short process? Was it a? a, a I, I remember. I remember when the times I really remember is when I would be tracking, and he would be there sitting next to me, 
and I would get tracks done and then Bo would go like, I, like we'll get to heaven and talk about heaven. So Bo would go, okay, give the guitar to Mike. S swear to God off my back onto Mike's back. I might've played, you know, 90% of the solo and the last 15 notes are Mike. And we'll get into, we'll get into something like that. But that, that was what was going down at that time um, for Eric you know, to his defense, you know, when we would go in to record solos, Bo would keep it bone dry. So no delay, no wash, just bone dry rhythms. That's great because you get the percussive thing going on. Solos really um, to record live from my perspective, especially with working with different producers from here on out, um, to have some wash, and to, you know, not to take it out of tune and to have some delay to let it fill and flow helps you get away from, you know, one, two, three, four. Um, and I don't know if Bo did that because he just wanted to discourage us or whatever, but it would turn around. It would, it would literally be Eric, go, go ahead. And it, it's the hardest thing to do is to play bone dry. And it's it, the it, hardest thing to do is to, I've heard some great players. I heard a cover band you know, a month or two ago, uh, play with us. And the guy's tone was so clean and he was nailing it. And that's, that's really hard to do. Yeah. Um, as a guitar player. So he didn't do Eric any favors and, and really he didn't help me out a whole lot either. I mean, I didn't have a lot of sauce and he would give it to Mike. And when Mike got it, Mike would say, give me, you know, give me a slap of 440 milliseconds and he'd get it and off he went, you know, but that, it's just a learning process. So but that's tough. It's never flattering on a dry, a dry signal. It's, dry it's, it, it's, 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 it's tough. It's tough. You know, it's funny. I went to the Monsters of Rock cruise recently and they had their, their contest for shredding, what have you. Um, and uh, even, so everyone was there. So Red Beach was watching too from afar. And he was telling me, he goes, man, that tone is, that tone is unforgiving. That Marshall JPM just sitting there dry is, yeah. Well, I wouldn't do it. Yeah. I wouldn't yeah. do it. And these guys yeah. are all going up there. I'm like, you got to give them credit because that is not easy to do. Yeah. When you're on the spot like that and your tone just is just unforgiving. Unforgiving. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You got to have delayed and reverb, which is it. so, well, you know, it's, it's, I don't want to call it training wheels, but it's just, it's just like icing on a cake. You know, it helps right. out. It sounds better yeah. than the ears too in most cases. So it, yeah. it depends, right? Okay, so we got that down, um, which is awesome. And then next, num next up is number seven, In the Sticks. In the Sticks is Mike Slamer. Okay, next seven, okay. And then we yeah. get to number eight, which is huge hit for you guys, Heaven. Yes, Heaven Thanks is so 90, well. yes, 90 percent me. The last vamp out. And then the last part where it goes in the bar is yeah. me. But the vamp up is Mike. Okay. Got so it. There's okay. about 20 notes in there that Mike played. Okay. Out of out of probably a hundred. And the biggest misconception is that Mike wrote hundred percent of that solo. <laughs> so, no. so to clear clarify that, clear the air a little bit. Yeah. 90% was you. Yes. That was a take the guitar off, hand it to Mike, because I couldn't get I couldn't get through. Bo was like, you know, yeah, and I, I, I just done. I needed a little TLC, and I didn't get it from Bo. I, the only time I got TLC was from an engineer. If Bo was in the vocal booth on the phone because he managed Winger at the time, yeah. If he was off the console and I was recording, then I got some TLC, and we get through full solos like Big Talk, for instance, but. You know, and no disrespect to Mike, I couldn't get, I couldn't get, where do I go from here to here to here? And he put, he put that jigsaw puzzle piece together, but that's most of my solo. Do you remember the guitar that you used, that you handed off to Mike? For On that one, I used the BC Rich Felix guitar. Wow. Okay. So it had an 81 EMG in it, a, a Kaler tremolo. I mean, it was just, we were at Kaler guys for a while and uh, the split fingerboard. You know, oh, half maple, incredible. half mahogany. <laughs> you don't see that anymore, man. You don't see stuff like that. Do you still have that guitar? I don't. I sold, dude, I sold so many guitars. When I went through my first divorce, I lived off my guitars for a year. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's a sad commentary, and I'd take them all back if I could. 
but um you know somebody's enjoying it somewhere right iconic guitar dude of that of that era you know you don't see that um okay wow so how do we clarify that because that solo from heaven is to me i call it shred conic because you can hum it it's memorable it is this classic solo and a great song and it's it's finally it's awesome to finally get it clarified on who did that uh two more tracks left on this and we're get through riding high riding high is mike mike okay yeah mike's number dead okay and last track to close it out cold sweat um mike and eric turner okay eric did it okay got wow. it and that was and that was your first album so after having him come in you guys are now saying okay so we got another guitar player in the band essentially coming in here you know doing this the souls all sound great you know and now we're going to go do our next album about a year apart it's going to be released so right. going into it were you more prepared for what was going to be pushed in your direction as far as Mike coming in and being a part of it or 